This film is dedicated to my father whose fascination with steam engines took our family on vacation in the rail yard. If you've ever been on a steam train, you know the smell of the soot, the white smoke, the sound of the whistle, and the rumble of the engine. I got started here about 12 years ago, and the thing that got me into it was my father. He's worked here for about 40 years. He recently retired uh, just after they brought out the diesels. He'd been here for 40 years, and it just seemed like a really cool job. Prepping the steam engine is, uh, I guess you'd have to start the night before, because what we do at night is we'll, use what's called, we'll do what's called a bank. We'll knock out almost all the fire except for one little spot and put a big mound of coal on it and it'll slowly burn all night. Because getting a coal fire started in the morning, if there's no fire to begin with, is very difficult. You've got to start with wood, get nice white hot embers and before you can throw coal in. So we bank it and let it burn overnight. And then in the morning, the first thing you want to check is your water level to make sure that no water leaked out during the night or anything like that. Check your water level, once that's all set, you'll tip your bank over and then get a nice hot fire going. And usually you have about 20, 30 pounds of steam pressure in the morning. So you want to build that up to at least 100 pounds in order to start moving around. And then you'll inspect all the mechanical aspects of it. Even though they are, uh, they look like they have a lot of moving parts, they are relatively simple. Uh, you know, it's, it, you, a lot of people see moving parts and things like that, and they think they're very complex machines. They're really not once you get down to the operating aspects of it. So check bearings, stuff like that. Check for worn or broken parts. In 1861, Sylvester Marsh patented the cog mechanism. It's a device that's used to make the locomotive safe when it's either ascending or descending the mountain. Uh, the way it engages is actually pretty simple. It, in the simplest terms, it's basically like a, uh, a bicycle sprocket and a chain. The chain is basically fixed to the tracks and that gear engages that and that's one of the reasons the cog railway is so safe because a lot of mainline rails is steel wheels on steel rails and there's not a whole lot of traction with that. With us, you know, we have that gear engaged and that's used for both climbing and for braking. The wheels are just there to keep us rolling and that's what allows us to stop quickly and things like that should we have to on a cloudy day or something. It doesn't happen often but... We run the steam engine once a day, either at 8.15 this time of year during peak cold season or 9.15 in the morning. Known for the world's worst weather, Mount Washington is also known for the first mountain climbing railway. From horse and buggy to bicycles to steam engines, trains, cars, and airplanes, mobility creates recreational and educational travel and amusement. Sylvester Marsh, an engineer inventor, built the Cog Railway to climb 6,288 feet above 
the clouds. Well, it can be uh, it can be beautiful on days like today, and it can be horrible. Sixty mile an hour winds, snow, any time of year. We actually just had snow four days ago, and yesterday it was in the fifties. It's very very unpredictable. You have no idea what could happen. I mean, it could be a sunny, beautiful day, and then all of a sudden, in ten minutes, it can just turn into a snowstorm. Some days it may look like it's horrible and cloudy up there, and it's above the clouds and beautiful, and you just. It is the most unpredictable mountain, I think, and that's why it fascinates people so much. Oh. Yeah, I hear. I hear you. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, it is really beautiful here, I'll tell you. It's, this is the first time we've ever been here when it's been clear at the top of the mountain. You can see the blue sky, and the sun is out, and it's not... One of the things is the carbon footprint that the steamers leave. They burn a thousand gallons of water and a ton of coal just making one trip to the summit. And with these diesel engines, they're much more faster, much more efficient. They only use about 18 gallons of fuel doing a round trip, 16 going up to coming down. And they're far more efficient. They don't have to stop a third of the way up to take on water. Uh, there's a lot less moving parts and stuff like that, a lot less complexity. Uh, they got computer controls now that can monitor stuff that the engineer would have a hard time paying attention to sometimes on a steamer. Biodiesel is a mixture of uh, diesel fuel and uh, I guess um, some people say it's violator oil. You can use vegetable oil, uh, beef oil, anything like that, and it's been refined. They put a catalyst in it and they use it to, it's used typically to add to a fuel source. And it, you know, we can make it right here in the United States. There's no reason to import oil from other countries. It uh, doesn't produce quite as much power and it's a little finicky in cold weather. It tends to gel up, but they have fuel additives and things like that to help us deal with that. Uh, pretty much you just start it. And that has a lot of computer controls into it and it actually will not let you move unless certain things are at certain degrees. Uh, the hydraulic oil has to be above 60 degrees in order for it to move. The engine coolant has to be above 100. So if it's not warmed up and ready to go, it just won't move. And that's one of the great things about these diesels is, you know, they take a lot of operator error out of stuff because there's a lot of computer control over it. It's time now to climb Mount Washington via the Cog Railway. On the way up, we'll go by biodiesel. On the way down, we'll come down by steam train. Now down on that end of the coach, on that side back there, there is a door. But please don't try to go out through the door because the drop off through the doorway can be anywhere between 3 feet to 30 feet. So please don't go out through the door. And don't worry about a thing unless you see me go out through the door. Then you just got now the two big black wheels that you can see down there in the back, those are my handbrakes and I will take care of those for you. And down in the rear of the coach on that side, should be able to see a pump handle and a couple of gauges and perhaps even a lever. And what that is is the Sprag braking system. And what that does is, is if anything should happen to that engine going up the mountain, if he should fall away from us or stall or anything, that's automatically going to lock us right on the tracks where we are. We can't go rolling backwards down the mountain. That sound okay? <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that one myself. Takes the throw out of it. Yeah, a little, huh? <laughs> now, if you folks would like to operate these air conditioners in the coach, all it is is a matter of just picking up on that. Right there. Like that. 
and they'll all slide down for you. Some of them definitely do work a little easier than other ones, but they'll work all right for you. Would you like that down? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, folks, I just got the word we're ready to go. Are you ready to go? Yeah! All right, I'll be right back. Yeah. This little river that we're crossing now is called the Amanusa River. And it starts up at the lakes of the Clouds Lakes, up at the Amanusa Ravine. I think if you look right over to the left hand side of the coach and out those windows, you may see our moose standing out there. Now I do guarantee this moose isn't going to move a muscle so you can take this picture. Like so many of our greatest inventors who have been ridiculed for thinking outside the box, Sylvester Marsh was told by the New Hampshire legislature he might as well build a railway to the moon. The first engine built, the pepper sauce-shaped Hero, successfully pushed a car loaded with passengers up a short length of track on Mount Washington in 1866. Thankfully, Sylvester Marsh's demonstration of a mountain climbing railway secured funds from investors, and the COG railway was completed three years later in 1869. So then Mr. Marsh teamed up with another New Hampshire gentleman by the name of Walter Aikens from Franklin, New Hampshire. And together they came up with and built the old Pepper Assassin that's down on our base station lawn today. That's that old green number one engine that has the upright boiler. And then Pepper Sass was shipped by rail from Franklin, New Hampshire to a town called Littleton, New Hampshire, just about 30 miles away from here. And there in Littleton, old Pepper Sass was disassembled, brought that 30 miles through the woods by ox teams, and then reassembled down where the base station is today. Pepper Sass is also the same engine that was used to build the Cod Railway. And in 1866, construction was begun, and in 1869, the Cod Railway was finally completed. Pepper Sass made its first journey up Mount Washington July the 3rd, 1869. The Cog Railway has pretty much been in continuous use ever since 1869. And also the Cog Railway has never been used for anything except recreational use. It's never been used for logging, or mining, or any other purpose except to bring folks safely up and down Mount Washington. Ran out of gas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we stop before we go through any of the switches here on the Cod Railway, just to make sure that everything's lined up before we pass through. So this switch is called the Lola Warbeck switch, and it was built right up here on the side of the mountain by the track crew. And it's solar powered, hydraulically operated. Now before we had this switch, we had an old hand switch that had nine separate moving pieces that all had to be moved one piece at a time by the brakeman. Some of those pieces actually weighed over a hundred pounds. Now, if I could just ask the folks on the left-hand side of the coach to do me a big favor, and that would be if you could please stay inside those windows until we get by the wall that water tank we're coming to. That would be great. And the reason I ask you to do that is just because we're only going to be about six inches away from the water tank and don't want anybody to get hurt. Now, by the way, that water tank is completely level, by the way. Oh, sure. And it is almost 100 years old. It holds about 6,000 gallons of water. Thank you. And yes, we still use the water tank today. The steam engine will take on anywhere between three to 400 gallons of water out of the water tank on that trip up every day. And that's because it takes a steam engine, a ton of coal, thousand gallons of water to make one trip up and down Mount Washington. The water tender on the steam engine holds about 700 gallons of water, so they need to stop there and top off the water supply. And the water in the tank comes from a spring about a half a mile up the mountain out the woods on the right hand side of the track. 
And that's all completely gravity fed. There are no pumps pumping the water up into that water tank. Now in the days when they used to use Ephesus to come up to down to Mount Washington, they would have to stop off at what was called the half wood house and plug it to a wood supply. Because old Ephesus is a wood fired boiler. Well, coming up right on the right hand side of us, that would be that halfway house. And this structure, just like all the rest of the dogs, is exactly level. Now there's a big window right inside of this building. If we pass by, if you look at our reflection in that window, that will give you a little bit of an idea as to how steep the grade really is here on these tracks. This is Jacob's Ladder. This is the steepest point on the Dog Railway. A 37 foot four watch of sun. Now this is also known as being one of the world's most treacherous railway trucks. That's because it has a 40 foot drop off on one side. And a 30 degree slope of the corner right in the middle of it. And by the way, it might be the inside the coach where you folks are. And I'm out here. By the way, that end of the coach right now is just about 12 feet more than this end is up here where I'm at. Definitely a lot steeper than it looks. Now whenever you see that black smoke coming out of that stack like that, that's the fireman throwing in more coal on top of the fire. The fireman on that engine actually will shovel a ton of coal going up and down the mountain. And he has to shovel that ton of coal one handed. And that's because he needs his other hand to open up the fire door. And he'll throw a scoop of coal in around every seven seconds. And if you're curious what the numbers are down on the right hand side of the tracks, well think of those numbers as the same thing as a mile marker on a highway. Those are there so we know where we are all the time on the dog railway. And we start with number one at the base station, and we end with number 1212 on the southern of the mountain. Now the brakemen also use those numbers, because again, I'm continuously inspecting these tracks going up the mountain. And if I didn't see anything that didn't look right to me, all I need to do is radio back to my track box the corresponding number, and then know exactly where to go to check out any issues that might be. Now we also have a track crew that's on duty here, Monday through Friday. These tracks were also inspected several times a season by the Hampshire Department of Transportation. And our track crews replace up to 12% of the tracks every year. Now looking up the mountain, over on the left hand side once again, you can see some vehicles coming up the top section of the Mount Washington Auto Road. This starts over in Pinkham Notch, New Hampshire on Route 16. Coming up right in front of us is more of these cars. These cars are marked the Appalachian Trail. It starts down in Georgia and ends up out the top of the main. The it takes up to six months to hike the Appalachian Trail. Now up on the right hand side of us on the hill, that would be the Sherman Adams Observatory. And that's named after the former New Hampshire Delaware Sherman Adams. His first night was up in 1980. Now down in the basement of the observatory, they have a brand new weather museum that was just opened up this year. And in that weather museum, they do have the actual wind gauge that measures the 231 mile an hour wind speed. You folks all have tickets to get into that museum for your charge.
The devil's shingle, as it was called, was used by railroad employees to descend from the summit of Mount Washington to the base. It was just a simple wooden contraption. It fit right over the center cog rack and had two little wooden handles for brakes. Now, if you figure that the track is just over three miles long, and they made it down in well under three minutes, and there's even some places up here on top where it's kind of flat, that means on the steeper parts of the track, they had to make up time somewhere, and they were probably going somewhere over 70, 75 miles an hour. No, thank you. They still do that. Uh, no, they stopped doing that a while ago because a few people didn't walk away. So uh, yeah. they, uh, they, they kind of they stopped doing it back in the 30s. So uh, fortunately, we won't be going quite that fast today. On the way up, it took us about an hour. Track's about three miles long. We were going about three miles an hour. On the way down, we're going to fly right along and go about five miles an hour. So it'll be a nice, slow roller coaster ride. And fortunately, there's no loops. So <laughs> good thing, right? So on the way up, the engineer was using steam pressure in his cylinders with, with the pistons that turned the gears and he pushed us up the mountain. On the way down, he's going to use air pressure in his cylinders and that will control his speed. He's got a little intake underneath the boiler there. He's got a valve right in front of him that he'll use to control how much air is going into the cylinders. And by that way, he'll control the pistons and basically slow himself down on the way down. So he'll open that valve up when we get to some of the flatter parts, allow his pistons to work a little more freely. When we get to the steep, steeper parts, he'll close it down and uh, you know, slow himself right down. So I'll be up here on the brakes using the brakes to control the speed of the coach and also not push him too fast down the mountain. Actually, on the flatter parts, I will. I'll take my brakes off. We'll use the weight of the coach to push him across the flats. But on the steeper parts, I can't be pushing him at all. So I'll use the brakes to actually lift the weight of the coach off the engine. We call it getting light. So I'll use this one here. This is called my set brake. Operates the brake on the down mountain axle here. I'll use that on the steeper parts. I'll set it about how I like it. And then I'll use this one over here. This is called my play brake. That operates the brake on the up mountain axle. And I'll be using that to make adjustments throughout the trip. Take that down. So I have different ways I know when to add brake or take brake off. I have some visual markers on the side of the tracks I'll be looking for. I listen to the engine. I listen to the chug, chug, chug. If I hear that speeding up, that tells me I need to add a little bit of brake. If I hear it slowing down a little, I can take a little brake off. I'll watch the engine from time to time. You might see the engine seem to rise up in front of us. That tells me he's leveling off so I can take some brake off. You see the engine dip down. He's pitching over. I need to add a little bit of brake. I also have my uh, high technology vibration sensor here on the floor. It's a piece of steel that's welded to my bumper. And through that, I can feel the vibrations from the engine. So when I'm trying to get light and take the weight of the coach off the engine, I'll be feeling those vibrations start to ease up. And actually, what I want to do is stay about that far away from him on the steeper parts of the track. So it's a little tricky. I might pull a little bit further away from him. I try not to go too far away because I don't want to take a chance on slamming back into him. So if I do pull away from him a little, I'll catch up gradually and try and get on as gently as possible. MW9 leaving the summit. Count is 70. questions folks? <laughs> Any, we'll find out. Any last requests before we head out? <laughs>